Good morning. So here we are, day one. It's been a long and interesting last six months. If like me, you got kind of got out of the school routine, well, we got to start to get back into it. So one of the things we're going to do on our days that we get together is we're going to do notes. Each day together, we're going to do probably about 30 minutes worth of notes. And I want to kind of go over the ground rules for what you need to be doing while we while we take these notes. So I've put together a PowerPoint for each day that we're going to do it. And anytime students learn anything through PowerPoint, the number one question that students have is, well, what am I supposed to be writing down? What is the stuff I absolutely have to be having with me? And it's a good question, and it's a fair question. I'm going to post all the slides to Canvas, so you're gonna have access to those slides that way, but I really do believe it's a good practice and it's a good way to embed into you what you need to be learning if you write the notes down. Now, obviously there's no way that I can make you do this, but it is going to behoove you and help you, I think, if you'll write them down. Now, for the most part, I haven't jammed a ton of stuff into each slide. So I think it's a really good rule of thumb if you're gonna copy the notes down, which is what I, what I suggest for you to do, that you do it by, um, by writing them down. And what you need to write down is just write down everything that's on the slide. I'll go slow, I'll take my time, um, if you have questions, if there's something you want to know about, then what you need to do is you need to put those questions into the comments on the Zoom, and I'll answer each one of those questions as they come along at the end, or I'll answer, um, if there's a bunch of redundancies, I'll just make sure to answer everything before anyone has any questions before we call it a day. If for some reason you miss a class period, I'm gonna post all of these to YouTube so you can um, have access to that or maybe it was a day you were having a bad day or you were half asleep, whatever, and later on you wanna go back and review the stuff. Um, it's all gonna be on Canvas on YouTube, and you're gonna have access to everything you need. So, the first thing I wanna to emphasize to everybody is this class has four units. And obviously, we're gonna start off with unit one. Unit one is 1200 to 1450. If you have a notebook and you're having things, have a unit one tab. Everything we do right now starts with unit one. Um, sometimes we will also call this period one. Um, but the important thing to know is this is not the beginning of history. There are things that happened before this time period as well. And there's some basic background knowledge that we all need to have to be able to go forward and start to really um, start to look at what groups of people were living like in period one. So we're going to do a little background information today. And there's two big terms we're going to talk about that you're going to need to know because this will set the background for everything else that we're going to do for the rest of this unit. And these two terms are civilizations and empires. So let's start with civilizations. All right, so what is a civilization? A civilization is a large group of people that shares a common language, history, ethnicity, religion, 
written language, and that is important. All civilizations have some sort of recording system. Almost all of them are writing and culture. So you may have known, you may know about the ancient Egyptians. Okay, the Egyptians are a civilization. Everybody who was part of that civilization, they spoke a similar language. They had a similar ethnicity. They practiced a similar religion. They had a writing system and they share a common culture. Okay. All of those are traits of civilizations. Uh, another one you may know about the Jews or Harappan civilization or even Native American civilizations uh, in the Americas. These are the traits. If you share these things with another person, you're probably part of the same civilization. Now, we are not interested yet in what makes each civilization unique. What you need to know is all civilizations have these things. All civilizations have a religion. Now, do all civilizations practice the same religion? No. All civilizations have a writing system. Do they all have the same writing system? No. So we will talk later about the differences, but what you need to know right now is that if we call you a civilization, that means you have these characteristics. The first civilization is going to develop roughly around 4000 BC. And there is a correlation between when people start to grow food, when agriculture is discovered, and when you start to see civilizations develop. Before this, people lived in small bands of people that hunted, that gathered, that moved in small populations. But once people start turning to farming, that's when people start to plant roots, and that's when you start to see civilizations develop. Now, what's interesting is lots of people discover farming at about the same time. And those groups of people all discover it independently of one another all throughout the world. So there's groups of people in the Americas who discover farming and it's not long afterwards that they become, start to develop civilizations. People in the Middle East, in Africa, in East Asia, which we will call China, South Asia, all over the world, there will be civilizations that develop. And again, we're not interested in how those civilizations develop. What we're interested in is that civilizations develop all around the world. And all of them share these traits. One of the things that you're going to see is civilizations are always trying to maximize the amount of resources they can produce. And the most important resource any civilization can produce is food. You have to produce enough food for everybody. And the more food you produce, the more people you can support. And the more people you can support, the more powerful you can become. One of the things we're gonna look at later is that all civilizations fight wars. Well, why are you fighting wars? To take other people's stuff, their land, their goodies, or even to take over other people themselves. Well, the more people you can support, the more, longer, larger armies you can support, and the more, powerful your civilization can be. One of the things we're gonna talk about a lot in this class is power is related to how many, how many resources a group of people can accumulate. Why is the United States the most powerful country on earth? We don't have the largest population. It's because we produce the most resources and we can spend $3 billion on a drone something that lots of other groups of people just can't do. So power 
equals resources. And again, the most important resource source that a group of people can produce is food, although there will certainly be other resources that we will look at. Now, eventually, societies become so good at growing food that not everybody in society has to grow food to support everybody. Again, look at how good we are at producing food. What, what part of our country produces, percent of the population produces all of our food? Maybe it's 1%. So when civilization has become really good at producing food, an interesting thing happens. People stop, some elements of society, some groups of people, they don't have to produce food and they will start to learn trades. What you'll see is in all civilizations, specialization of labor develops. Some people might become priests. Some people might become shoemakers. Some people might become cloth weavers. But not everybody will be involved in production of food. Other resources will be produced by different groups of people who specialize in labor. But when civilizations start to do this, an interesting thing happens. Everyone's labor does not become valued equally. In a civilization, you might have one person who's a farmer and one person who is a silk weaver. Well, the silk weaver, what they produce can be seen as being more valuable and they will have a higher status or a priest or maybe a professional warrior. And what you see is when states produce excess amounts of food, civilizations, I should say, produce excess amounts of food, they don't, um, and you start to see people developing unique skills, unique traits, you start to see social stratification. You start to see class systems develop. All civilizations have social classes that comes from specialization of labor and what labor is valued the most. Even in our society, this is true. The trash collector is not seen as being of equal in importance as the doctor. What you produce is oftentimes, if not most of the times, related to your social class. And in each civilization, you will have a group of elites develop, emerge, a ruling class of people. Now, another thing that all civilizations do is they create new technologies. Many of the early technologies were based around how to maximize agriculture. Early civilizations focus on ideas like irrigation or learning how to make tools out of bronze and iron so they could grow more food and manage more land effectively. Later on, you'll see civilizations develop other technologies that will help to maximize other resources that they're trying to produce. But all civilizations focus on creating new technologies and fundamentally the point of the new technologies is to continue to help the civilization maximize the amount of resources they produce. All civilizations are patriarchal. Patriarchal means male dominated. Very few civilizations have had a woman leader for long periods of time. But there's also going to be social inequalities based between men and women. And many historians, including myself, believe that these divisions between male and female power come with agriculture. With agriculture, with the growth of civilizations and with the need to do things like fight wars, the physical advantage that men have over women became more valued in society. Men can do more work, men can work longer in the fields, men are more effective at fighting wars because of their size and strength compared to women. 
that the that the things that men produce became more valued. Plus, oftentimes women are out of commission for nine months at a time and they can't do physical labor. So this is going to lead to a gap between the social equality between men and women and all civilizations struggle with patriarchy, even civilizations today. So how these different societies we're going to look at practice patriarchy differs. But again, the big theme is all early civs and even civilizations today have patriarchy. I've said this already. They're going to focus on maximizing production. It is a role of civilizations to produce as much food, to produce as many goods as they possibly can to support large populations. And again, resources equals power. And this is gonna become an ongoing theme in this class. All civilizations have complex government. All civilizations have large populations. And if you have a large population, you have to have an effective way to govern them. Look at how complicated our government system is. But even civilizations back thousands of years, like the Egyptians or like the Romans, had super complex governments with lots and lots of different layers and responsibilities and power to govern large populations. Almost all civilizations have a class of religious leaders, and the religious leaders back political leaders. Many, many, many political leaders throughout time and civilization. Their claim to fame is some, their claim to power, I should say, is associated in some way, shape, or form with claiming that the deity that society worships is backing them. Even in today, look in our currency, it says in God we trust. That is a claim of divine support. But many, 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 many civilizations will have a much stronger tie between the deity and the power of the individual in charge. For example, in Egyptian society, they taught that the Pharaoh was a god. And that's why you had to listen to him. In India, the ruling class of people are the Brahmins. They are the Hindu religious leaders, and they are backing political systems. So this is a very, very common theme throughout time. All civilizations are going to fight wars. This is a sad thing, but people are jerks. And when you see someone else with nice things, and you're like, wait, we're bigger, stronger, more powerful than them, people tend to go and try to take their stuff. This is an emerging thing that happens all over the world. The last thing with civilizations is that civilizations support the arts and they build monumental architecture. And we're gonna talk a lot about monumental architecture in this class and what the point of monumental architecture is. Monumental architecture is designed to show the power and glory of the state and the individuals that are in charge. Some examples of early monumental architecture that you may know of, the pyramids of Giza, the Roman Colosseum, uh, the Taj Mahal, which is not early, but is also a later example of monumental architecture. All of those are designed to show the power and glory of the state and to show the strength because only big, strong, powerful civilizations can spend the amount of time, effort, and resources to build those things. So monumental architecture is an important trait of early civs. Now, this right here, is a map. These are the world regions that you're gonna see us talk about a lot in this class. Eventually, we're gonna to have to know all these world e regions, things like East Asia. East Asia means China, basically. South Asia, which means India. But I want you to see for right now, all the different places 
that early civilizations developed. And as a general rule of thumb, they develop around very, very fertile farmland, oftentimes supported by rivers. So these are the places you'll see civilizations, especially by the start of this class, which is 1200 AD. Now, there's a second thing we need to talk about, and that's empires. Now, an empire is a, is a form of a political state. There's lots of types of different types of states. And in history, what we mean by state is what a lot of people in America think of as a country, okay? When we say state, we're not talking about like the state of Georgia. We're talking about countries, but you're never going to see that term countries in this class. A state is that. And you, in ninth grade, you learn what the definition of a state is. A state is a place. It is a thing that has boundaries, that has populations, that has a government with popular sovereignty. I'm not going to rehash everything you learned in sixth grade, but I mean, ninth grade, excuse me, but we're really, really interested in this one type of state. And this type of state is an empire. And here's why we're so interested in empires in this class. We can't possibly cover all the history of mankind in a one year class. So what is it that we cover? What is it that we talk about? What we talk about is the most important stuff, but that gets us to a really funky situation. And that question is, what is important? Because what is important to you may not be important to me. And when we say important, what we really mean is influential things that touch as many different groups of people as possible. I'm really, 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 really important to my daughter. But that doesn't mean because I'm important to her that I should be teaching about the life and times of Ron DeQuatro in an AP World History class. No one's making a value judgment on what is important or not. But what we can do is we can say, this is influential. And influences how many people have you touched in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And empires produce an enormous amount of influence because of what an empire actually is. An empire is a state that has conquered other groups of people. So by definition, the original group of people that started the empire, their influence, their ideas, their beliefs are spreading to other groups of people through conquest. Empires can often be very, very large and they can control an enormous amount of territory, but what's much, much, much more important to us is that they can control a vast amount of resources. And again, resources equals power. Now, the first thing you need to know about an empire is they have all of the traits of a civilization. So if I said right now, I want you to post a bunch of things you know about the Gupta Empire, you might say the Quattro, I've never heard of the Gupta before in my life. I don't know anything about them. And I would say lies, because I've just taught you a bunch about the Gupta, because I said they have all the traits of a civilization. So without knowing any details, you know they have a complex government. You know they're focusing on maximizing food production, that they have social classes, that they have hierarchy, that they build monumental architecture. That's how you need to think of this class. If you see the word empire, you might not know the specifics, but you know the big picture ideas that they're going to have. And that's the type of history we're trying to learn in this class. This class is not about dates, people, and events. 
It's about the application of concepts. And that's really important. So if by definition, an empire is a group of people who have conquered other groups of people, by definition, empires are multicultural and multi-ethnic. If you go back and you look at like the Roman Empire, and I said to you, what did a Roman look like? The correct answer is, I don't know. It could be anything. You could be an Egyptian. You could be a Jew. You could be people who were black. Their power went far enough south in Africa that they're absolutely people we would identify as being black who lived in the Roman Empire. Arabs, you would have had, they would have at one point gone so far east that you would have seen people from the Middle East into it. Every color of the rainbow would have been in this empire. You would have seen dozens and dozens of different languages involving lots of different cultures and lots of different people. And this is an ongoing theme of empires. Empires are multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multilinguistic. And Here's a really good way of looking at empires, I think. And I think if you'll think of empires this way, it will help you. I've never agreed with how we identify empires. When we call it the Roman Empire, again, I'm just using this example. It kind of makes you think that everybody in the empire was Roman. And that's not true. You might have been part of that empire, but you would probably have been a different ethnicity, race, and spoke a different language than Latin. When you think of empires, you should think of it as apostrophe S. Don't think of it as the Roman Empire. Think of it as the Romans' possessive empire. The people who built it, the people who are in power, the people who control it. Don't think of it as the Song Empire. Think of it as the Songs, apostrophe S in China. Possessive. Because most people who are in an empire, especially the big ones, are not part of the empire that, are not part of the group of people that originally built it. So, lots of different cultures, lots of different people that don't look the same, act the same, talk the same, have the same culture. You'd see lots of different religions in an empire. Many different languages and religions are practiced. Now this gets us to a funky thing. If I'm a group of people and I've conquered lots and lots of different other groups of people, how should I govern them? Well, the biggest fear empires have is rebellions especially when you get so big that there are more people in your empire who are not you where you're the minority you're in power but you don't make up the vast majority of the population how do we keep the people we've conquered in check and what empires do is they practice tolerance they don't try to force their culture on groups of people they've conquered they don't try to force their ideas. They don't try to force their religions as a rule of thumb. They're trying to give the groups of people they've conquered as few reasons as possible to rebel. And one of the ways that you do that is not only do you practice tolerance towards the groups of people that you've conquered, you also incorporate them into your system. If I've conquered another group of people, I'm going to incorporate the elites that we've conquered into my government, into what an important term we're gonna look at in just a second, into my bureaucracy. The people who had power before me in a region will oftentimes still have power after I've gained control of them. And the other thing you do is you incorporate the conquered groups of people into your military. When you incorporate pe groups of people you've conquered into your military, it does two things. Number one, it makes them feel like they're a part of this empire. 
Number two, it gives you larger armies. And guess what you can do with those larger armies? You can go conquer more groups of people that you can incorporate into your system and into your, your empire. And that can give you even more resources. And it just becomes a bigger and bigger circle. We conquer one group of people. We incorporate them into our army. Now we have a larger army. We can go attack more people and take more land and incorporate more groups of people. And this cycle just keeps continuing and perpetuating itself. Now, because empires can control so much land, they have a very, very, very complex government. Power is centralized in empires. Power is in the hands normally of one person called an emperor. Now, different places will call it different things, but an emperor. And all power ultimately comes from that emperor. And as we learn from civilizations, a lot of times the, emperor claim, the emperor's claim of power has something to do with religion. But one person cannot possibly manage all the work that comes with governing an empire by himself. And most of the time, it is a him. So what do they do? Empires all have bureaucracies. A bureaucracy is ruled by appointed officials to help the leader govern. The emperor will develop complex systems and they will leave people in charge of different regions of their empires and those people are put in power by the emperor and they can be replaced by the emperor if they're not doing a good job they're ruled by bureaucrats and oftentimes what not all the times but oftentimes an emperor will pick someone from a certain region to help him govern that region so again using the roman empire as an example Important bureaucrats in Egypt will oftentimes be Egyptian. Important bureaucrats in Judea will oftentimes be Jews. And this is a way, again, of incorporating conquered groups of people into power and also making them feel like they are involved. So there's one thing that empires do really, really, really well, and that's economic production. Empires are really, really good at producing resources and controlling resources. But generally speaking, groups of people who are parts of empires do a lot better than groups of people who are not because empires have the ability to produce so many, so many resources that they can produce um, enough goods to support large populations and to give, in many ways, a better life to many people in those empires. Trade is promoted in empires. It's a big deal. All empires promote trade to maximize the amount of resources that their empire produces. How do they do that? They're going to issue currency, and this makes trade much easier. Before Europe was conquered by the Romans, let's say, you had all these different regions using all of these different currencies and trade was hard. Once the Romans conquered it all, one currency is used in the whole place and that will help facilitate trade. Empires build roads to support trade. It takes an entity with lots of power and resources to build a road system that connects many different cities. You don't tend to see these things in regions of the world until empires are formed there and empires are trying to maximize production of resources. Roads are also important to empires because not only do they support trade, it helps you get troops from one place to another because you've got to constantly show the groups of people you've conquered who is in charge. And if one part of your empire does start to rebel, you need to get troops there quickly. So it also helps them project power. They make trade safer. Before the Roman Empire, again, using this one example, one of the problems with trade in the Mediterranean was there was lots and lots of piracy. Well, when the Romans came to power and they conquered all the region around the Mediterranean, the Romans made it very clear to anyone that if you steal from merchants trying to sail and trade on the Mediterranean, we see that as you are stealing from us because we tax the merchants. 
So if you're going to steal from us, the penalty has to be very severe. And the penalty for theft and stealing from merchants in the Roman Empire was crucifixion. And that stomped out piracy very, very quickly. Again, lots of groups of people are going to do things to make safe trade, trade safe because empires rely on that trade. Empires rely on the trade to support their populations, but the governments of empires also rely on trade to tax it to help them have the resources they need to govern large areas. So these are all common themes of empires. And again, how different empires do these things change from place to place and area to area. But the fact that empires do these things does not. When we start this unit, these are some of the major empires in the world that we're going to look at. We're going to look at empires in China, in India, and in the Middle East, and in Europe, and in Africa, and in the Americas. So just like with civilizations, you're going to see that there's going to be empires that develop all around the world as well. So that's going to do it for the first day. If you have any questions, put them in comments. I'll answer them. You're about to be given an assignment. Make sure you get the assignment done. And I, we're going to get through this mess together. We're going to get through it all in one piece. And I'll see you guys tomorrow.